Hi there, welcome back to another edition of IndyCar. This one, unscheduled actually, but I had planned to do this broadcast um, last week, but never got the chance to do it. Now, I've said before that I've done an awful lot of research um, into Scotland's demographics, the reasons why people vote particular ways, and the, um, the remaining legacy of basically the depopulation of Scotland by the British state following the uh, the rebellion in, uh, in 1645. Okay, so Scotland, as you know, has a long history and not a pleasant history with regards to its larger neighbour further south. And of course, you know about the Highland Clearances. But what you may not know is that even after the Highland Clearances, there has been a constant drain of Scottish talent away from Scotland, uh, migrating to other parts of the British Empire and other parts of the world in, in general. But more recently, the brain drain has mostly been to the south, where all the best jobs are. And this is one of the problems that Scotland has. As its um, Scots and Gaelic-speaking population were gradually uh, deported or exported or forced out of Scotland just simply because there weren't the jobs for them, there wasn't the opportunity for them here. That has led to um, an influx of people from south of the border who have moved to Scotland in search of work and a better way of life. Now, there's nothing wrong with that in principle. However, what it does do is it has, over the hundreds of years that it's been going on, has created a two tier class system in Scotland, which didn't exist before. What I mean by that is that um, the, the best jobs in Scotland, the people who earn the most, who are in positions of power, largely um, see their positions in, in these uh, plum jobs and in these careers as being down to being part of the union. And of course, many people came to Scotland from other parts of the UK um, to fill jobs which were advertised in London because, let's face it, the top jobs in Scotland in things like um, higher education for the university for, or universities, for example, uh, but also in the judiciary and the legal profession at the upper echelons of judges and magistrates and procurators, fiscal and other senior figures in the Scottish legal system are mostly advertised um, across the UK. And many of the people who fill these positions obviously have come from other parts of the United Kingdom. And also, interestingly, the political elite which runs Scotland is largely drawn from all across the United Kingdom. And the reason for that is very simple, and that is because the devolved administration at Holyrood is a creation of the British state. And therefore, the British state has created the rules which allow it to function. And of course, we know the constraints of Holyrood very, very well. Holyrood is not allowed uh, to legislate on anything to do with the constitution or to do with defence or to do with foreign policy. Those three areas are taboo, which means that the Scottish administration at Holyrood is basically um, a colonial management of the Scottish province on behalf of the British state. And so anyone who works in, uh, in Holyrood at the moment, either as a civil servant or as a politician, is essentially employed by the British state, even though their function in, in their job is to run the Scottish state on behalf of the British government. And that leads people in, in these jobs to feel that they are obligated to preserve the union because they feel um, worried that their positions in this elite would be at risk if they decided that they wanted to support independence. So we have this demographic, this upper echelon at the top strata of Scottish society, which runs everything and has all the best jobs. Now remember that the university system in Scotland is still an elite system. It takes the best and the brightest. But also remember that Scotland's education system still permits fee paying schools. So we still have private education. We still have preferment because of private education. People's children who are basically whose parents can afford to send them to these poor schools, expect those children to go on to university places. And of course, the universities themselves will always take the most promising and best educated students they can find. But, and here's the but, universities only take about 10% of the Scottish, available Scottish um, school leavers of the highest standard into the higher education system, which means that 90% of the students in Scottish education's higher echelons in the upper universities, if you feel like the top 
uh, of the um, education system are not Scots. They are from all parts of the United Kingdom, all parts of the globe. Which means that those who come out of those universities with the top degrees, the doctorates, the master's degrees and so forth, go on to take these top places in the Scottish system or migrate to England. So we still have this problem of the vast majority of Scots who earn less than the, the sort of medium wage, if you like, the average, are left really shut out and in this underclass. So you have this elite class supported basically and put in place by the British state and kept there uh, on the basis that they will support the union. And this is why we have so many unionist politicians in Scotland. Apart from the fact that the United Kingdom has designed a three, three separate voting systems for Scotland, so that we can only vote using first past the post in the British system, which means that we can only ever, at the very most, elect 59 MPs. And at the moment, Scotland has, uh, if I remember correctly, something like 46 MPs in Westminster who are pro-independence, which, if my mental arithmetic is correct, represents about 40, sorry, about, about 74% of Scottish MPs are pro-independence, which is great. That's a majority. And under the existing expected uh, British political system, the Tories always claimed that, and Margaret Thatcher was famous for making this uh, particular statement, that all Scotland needed to become independent was to elect a majority of nationalist MPs to Westminster. And that has happened for at least the last three general elections. There have been majorities of pro-independence MPs at Westminster for the last three general elections, and yet we still have not been able to declare our independence. Now, the reason for that is, is many fold, but one of the major reasons is devolution, because when devolution happened in 1997 under Tony Blair's new government, it was designed specifically to defuse the motivation of Scots to vote for independence. Now, initially, the SNP was pretty much against devolution because they knew it was a halfway house and it was basically a blind alley, a trap that we wouldn't be able to get out of. The Labour Party um, chose the voting system uh, and made it such that it was impossible for the Scottish Parliament ever to have a majority in favour of independence, or so they thought. Alex Salmond, um, interestingly in 2011, completely broke that system and achieved a majority for independence, which resulted in the first referendum in 2014. But it should really have, uh, have actually caused independence to take place at that moment, but didn't. So we are in this weird position where everything that is to do with running Scotland and all of its major big, big box industries are basically either British companies or companies from outside the UK with connections to the Conservative Party and everybody who is in high positions of authority in Scotland are not in favour of independence because their entire uh, existence at that elite level, in their perception at least, is dependent on remaining in the Union. However, there are a number of reasons why you could argue that that's not the case. However, the, um, the reality of the situation right now, as far as I'm concerned anyway, is that the majority of Scots who favour independence are those who are not in these elite positions. There are very few of us who have the wealth and the means and have the kind of um, top of the range jobs uh, and still support independence. Very few who actually do that. Some may be uh, shall we say, ambivalent towards independence, but not necessarily convinced. And these are the ones we really need to work on. There is something else going on here as well, which is worth noting. If you are a student of Scottish history, and if you have ever read any of the, uh, the excellent papers on Scots history and the history of our culture and languages, especially by people like Professor Alf Baird, who published a paper recently on the colonisation of Scotland and the attempt by the British state to remove our culture, our languages and our traditions, we'll know that most of the Scots speakers in Scotland, and Scots incidentally was a language as well, which um, evolved separately from English, was one of the two languages spoken in Scotland at the time 
of uh, the 45 Rebellion and before that. But now any native Scottish speakers are basically looked down upon by this elite who have been taught that English is the superior language uh, and that the use of Scots is an inferior and a, a lower class method of communication. Now, it's this class stratification which has been reinforced time and again by the British state in all of its colonies in order to split and divide the population into a British supporting elite and everybody else. And everybody else is usually classified as those in lower wage employment or unemployment or working poverty. And by doing this, the British state has effectively removed the Scots language from Scotland almost entirely. There are very few Scots language speakers left because it has been cleared out so much through the education system, in fact through every system. You'll know that in schools English is taught as your first uh, as your first language and that even your parents probably, like, like mine would have said when you came home from, from school, stop talking in that, that school playground language. Now the school playground language was Scots. When we were talking in the playground, we would use a different form of language to the one we would use at home to our parents because our parents would be saying, oh no, you must speak proper English. Otherwise you won't get a decent job. You'll appear to be scruffy. You know, you won't give the right impression. And this is the kind of indoctrination that has been going on in Scotland for centuries. And it has left us with what's known as the Scottish cultural cringe. In other words, this feeling that our languages, our traditions, um, our entire culture is somehow inferior to this English, Anglophone, uh, Im imported and imposed culture, which we have been forced basically to accept as the norm. And that has also left us with not only this class stratification with the elite who think this way and look down their noses at everyone else who doesn't speak and think that way, and that has created and perpetuated this mythology that only the elite's position of power in Scotland can only be preserved by preserving the union and that all the riffraff who want independence are not going to get their own way. However, I class myself as one of those riffraff, despite the fact that I had the benefits of a good education and that I speak, as you know, um, as good English as anybody else, but I also speak Scots. When I'm outside, I speak in Glaswegian, and I'm proud of that. And none of us should feel ashamed or inferior when we're using this kind of language, and yet that is what the cultural cringe is all about. However, that's left us now with Scotland in a situation where its own politicians who are designing an independence referendum, with a situation where the British government will not sanction the independence referendum, they will not give it its legitimacy, but by not signing the Section 30 order, that offers the Scottish government an interesting set of possibilities. First of all, if the British government refuses to sign a Section 30 order, that means they have no right to participate officially as one of the two campaigning sides in a referendum. In other words, the no campaign in Scotland cannot be run by British political figures because they have effectively shut them, themselves out of campaigning by refusing to take part. Signing the Section 30 order does not just bind the United Kingdom to respect the result. It offers them the opportunity to campaign formally in the referendum. The Scottish Government, and the SNP in particular, at the moment, have the opportunity through Holyrood to design the voting system, the franchise, and to decide the rules of the referendum before the Electoral Commission is taken over by the British state. And if we do that, if Parliament were to set the rules and say, for example, that there are no television adverts allowed by either side, that the British state is not an official participant and may not use the TV medium to campaign against independence, and it can only be done by, for example, traditional methods like rallies <coughs> and public meetings and leafleting and perhaps even social media. But if we set the rules, then the British state would not be able to compete on its usual terms of being able to dominate the entire thing because it controls all of the, all of the mainstream media. But I doubt that will happen because at the moment the SNP has adopted um, 
shall we say, adopted uh, devolution as its basically as its means to get independence. But that means that the referendum, if it is offered to us in the next few months, will be run exactly the same way as the 2014 referendum, which means that it will go by vote numbers. It will not be like first past the post. We can't decide the voting system. Uh, we will get to decide the question as long as the question is the same one as last time. The, the demographics are such that we really need, and we have been promised, that members, uh, of basically citizens of the European Union who live and work here as Scots and pay taxes here, should have the right to vote, as should low-level prisoners in prison, as should um, migrants who've come to Scotland but whose status is now, shall we say, being looked at by, by the immigration authorities. But as soon as they're accepted as, say, refugees or as uh, legitimate asylum seekers, those people should also be offered the vote. But it leaves us still with this democratic difficulty, which is that the elite still believe wrongly, uh, in everybody's opinion, that their jobs depend on the union. They don't. Remember that most of the oil industry jobs in Scotland are through big multinational corporations. Now, OK, some of those, probably uh, their CEOs and other high ranking officials, will pay donations to the Tory party, linking them to the Tory party. However, anyone who works in the Scottish oil industry will know that oil is going to be needed and gas is going to be needed for some considerable time before the electrification of the, uh, the road system and vehicles in Scotland and generation in Scotland. So there will be opportunities for them into the future anyway. Those companies are not going to stop needing them just because Scotland becomes independent. And likewise, the politicians who may be fearing for their jobs, um, even ones who are in favour of independence, in everybody's opinion, that their jobs depend on the union. They don't. Remember that most of the oil industry jobs in Scotland are through big multinational corporations. Now, OK, some of those, probably uh, their CEOs and other high ranking officials, will pay donations to the Tory party, linking them to the Tory party. However, anyone who works in the Scottish oil industry will know that oil is going to be needed and gas is going to be needed for some considerable time before the electrification of the, uh, the road system and vehicles in Scotland and generation in Scotland. So there will be opportunities for them into the future anyway. Those companies are not going to stop needing them just because Scotland becomes independent. And likewise, the politicians who may be fearing for their jobs, um, even ones who are in favour of independence, will still be able to run for the Scottish Parliament because the Scottish Parliament will still be there, except that it will have full powers over everything. And we will need politicians to do that. And of course, the SNP has set the last few years, the last 15 or so years, has spent its time showing the Scottish public that Holyrood can run Scotland successfully. Yes, they've made a few really bad cock-ups. Yes, we have all pilloried them for them, but the point is that Scotland runs fairly smoothly and it can do that by itself. So adding the powers of, uh, let's say, defence, uh, foreign affairs and the constitution would not change that and those politicians will still be able to stand for election. The only ones who wouldn't make it, incidentally, are those who are members of British political parties because they would not be allowed to run any Scottish election. They could run, possibly, for a new party which they started registered in Scotland and there will always be a need for pro-business parties in Scotland, even after independence. There has to be a balance of left and right in order for the country to stay in the centre ground and to continue developing and flourishing. So I guess that what I'm saying to you today is that, that we face a, a stratified Scottish electorate. And the only way really to turn them around is to show these elites that their positions of power and influence are not threatened by Scottish independence at all. But what will happen after independence, and should happen after independence, is that Scottish universities, which, let's face it, are there to make money, they're not there principally to educate Scottish people as they used to be. The grants are not available anymore to educate Scotland's poorer students, those from less wealthy backgrounds. And of course, the universities, the top universities, favour 
privately educated students. And this is the class bias which needs really to be re-examined and eradicated from Scotland in the future. But that doesn't mean that the ruling elite will not stay. And remember that most of the political ruling classes who run the civil service and the judiciary are largely this elite upper middle class, this wealthy bourgeoisie, if you like, in Scotland, who see the union as the way to keep their stability and their jobs. We have to show them that that is that they're not threatened in any way by independence. It isn't going to make the slightest bit of difference to them. Their careers will play out just as they've been doing, and they will still have the opportunity for career enhancement in the same way as they always did. The difficulty here is that the demographics of Scotland are that somewhere in the region of 50,000 English migrants have been coming to Scotland every year for decades. And an equal or larger number of Scots have been leaving Scotland for decades as well. So there's been a constant inflow of British citizenry into Scotland and a constant outflow of poorer Scottish people who are looking for better opportunities, which don't exist under the UK system because they can't, because Scotland is denied having these highest level jobs in greater numbers. The careers available in Scotland are very limited, as everybody of my age, in fact of any age, will know that most of us, uh, anybody who goes through the education system and comes out with high level qualifications will be forced to go elsewhere to find a job. And that's something which would end come independence, because the companies that they're looking to get employment from would come to Scotland after independence, because Scotland will be trading with Europe and because we will have agreements, free trade agreements with other countries ourselves, that won't change. In fact, that will change, I suppose, for the better, not worse. So I think to round up today's programme, and this is more of a thought provoking programme, we need to speak more to the people that we know who have these high paying jobs, who make a lot of money, and who control to a large extent how businesses politics and high level education, science and research and so forth are conducted in Scotland. We have a, a larger and larger population who are disenfranchised, who don't have the training and the skills. And at the moment we're having to support them because we haven't created the job opportunities that they need, nor have we given them the training or the grants and bursaries required to actually educate themselves to get those jobs. All of this stuff has been heavily restricted. Um, Scotland has been basically depopulated of its Scottish speakers and of its Gaelic speakers. Gaelic is our second language here in Scotland at the moment. The numbers of fluent Scots speakers is tiny by comparison because they have all, almost all of them, uh, been displaced by people coming into Scotland from elsewhere in the UK. And this is not a racist rant, incidentally, these are just the facts. The fact is that Scotland has been depopulated and repopulated by the UK. And this is an old ploy that it is used in every one of its colonies. I say co colony advisedly here. Scotland fits the classification uh, under the United Nations description of colonies uh, exactly that our language, our culture uh, have largely been either eradicated, eroded, or suppressed and repressed. We've been made to feel like second-class citizens if you don't speak the Queen's English and uh, go to elite universities and accept jobs from British companies. So we are a colony. We are being exploited daily. And the only reason we don't know about it is because the British government doesn't let us see the figures. But we know that wealth is gushing out of the Scottish oil fields and gas fields. We are being forced to pay to sell our energy to the rest of the United Kingdom. Everything that the UK does in Scotland is there to disadvantage and keep Scotland in its place. That makes us a colony. And we could quite easily justify our ending the union on the basis of decolonization, of re-establishing Scotland as a place with its own culture, its own languages, its own laws, its own education system. Actually, public education system is the key. If you remove the elite system, then those wealthy fee-paying uh, scholars with the wealthy families are not advantaged in the same way. It's impossible then for universities to know 
whether somebody comes from a wealthy background and expects privilege uh, as a result. All of these things could be done after independence and all of them should be. But as I say, we need to get through to those in these elite positions and explain this to them. Say, look, you're not at threat. In fact, there are opportunities for you and for your children in the future to be equals rather than be an elite, but to take part in the expansion of all of Scotland's green industries and to lead the charge to a greener future. That is what Scotland is planning to do. The referendum may or may not work. It's highly likely that the referendum will be delayed, especially when the Queen dies, especially when there's a coronation, and there could be all manner of other reasons why it might be delayed, and all of them extremely convenient to the British state. None of them convenient to Scotland. And there are several other ways in which we can become independent. There are two that I can think of. One is, and it's been suggested many times, and discounted by the SNP, which is to have a general election, which is a plebiscite on independence. And that would be to invoke the power of our MPs in Westminster to end the union. And that is something which could easily be done and done quickly, and it would be clean, and it would be uh, entirely fair. It would be entirely democratic under the British system. But they have their first, first past the post voting system to keep their elite in power. We need it in order to get rid of their elites that are in power and to establish Scotland or restore Scotland's full powers as a nation without having to go to a referendum which would be controlled entirely by the British state, which it was last time. And the reason why the referendum is always a risky business is because of this, this democratic deficit that has taken place over centuries. More and more people from the United Kingdom flooding into Scotland, more and more um, Scots natives flooding out of Scotland, leaving Scotland much more of a balancing act between pro-independence and anti-independence votes. I think we can persuade many of these um, highly skilled, highly educated individuals who are currently running the country to back independence, but we need to offer them the same security that everyone else will expect. But we also need to create a playing field in education and in uh, job opportunities and career advancement, which is equal to equal for everyone. Eradicating public schools would be a uh, private schools, I beg your pardon, would be a huge step in that direction. Universities can also have their remits changed. So that the primary remit is to educate local people as the priority and have the largest sector in Scottish universities being Scottish kids basically who have done well and are smart enough um, to go to university and to get these top jobs rather than pulling people in from the rest of the world, the rest of the UK and squeezing the Scottish students out, which is essentially what's happening right now. So uh, these are things to think about. But when you are talking with friends who are perhaps swithering about independence, who may be in positions where they are plenty of money and they're working for either British companies or the civil service or the judiciary or so on. It's worth talking to them about this and saying, look, have you thought about what independence would mean for your career and your company and your business? Because Scotland is going to offer huge opportunities to all of these sectors. And not to mention the fact the civil service is going to become much larger when Scotland has ended its union with the UK, because then we need more civil servants to run the country. We'll need more doctors and nurses, we'll need more police officers. All of the public sector will expand because we will have to. Anyway, I guess that's it from me today. But these are things that have been turning around in my mind for a number of days. And having spoken with uh, Professor Alf Baird and many other people who are experts in Scotland's history and its constitutional laws, tell me the same thing. That what the SNP is doing with the referendum is one way of achieving independence, that's the closest, and at the moment it's the only way that we have to obtain independence, but it's not the only one. So if this doesn't work or it's delayed for any reason, there is another option. In fact, there are two other options. Either one of those needs to involve a general election, because the only politicians in Scotland who are actually empowered to end the union are not MSPs, not the First Minister, and not Holyrood. The only elected officials who have the power to end the union 
are those MPs at Westminster. There are 46 of them down there, SNP and ALBA, and they hold the power to end the union, just simply by walking out of Westminster and saying the union is over. That's all it takes, because they are uh, empowered. Th those are the members of the Scottish elected government. Remember, the Scottish government sits in Westminster alongside the English government, but it's still a Scottish representative. And as such, being the only elected Scots at Westminster, they are the only ones who can actually declare independence formally. So even if the referendum is a success and we get a yes vote, those 46, I think it is, pro-independence MPs would need to come home and declare it. And that would be a big step. Anyway, that's it for me today. I hope you've enjoyed the programme. I hope the sound quality is high enough that you can hear me. I'm working on the sound issues as we speak. But um, have a good day and I'll speak to you again tomorrow. Bye for now.